we go with another edition of the Stampede Wrestling Show. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio. We've got a great show for you this afternoon with uh, one of the living legends of wrestling, famous butcher Paul Deshaun. But uh, before I do that, I'm going to introduce uh, my co-host for the afternoon. And welcome, Bruce, to Heartbeat Radio. Hi, Bob. How are you? Uh, nice to be back. Uh, looking forward to an engaging conversation uh, with our old friend Paul the Butcher Restaurant. I have another caller coming in from area code 989. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio. Mark Bougeon Mark, calling Mark in. Mark Bougeon, how are you doing, Mark? Good, good to hear good. from you. Uh, here. Uh, good, good. Nice, nice to hear your voice again, Hi, Mark. Uh, good, Bruce. Good to hear you also. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. You had a bit of uh, background with some of the French Canadians in uh, in Detroit. There, there's a few of them that were pretty prominent back in the day. Uh, Vachons and them never really worked Detroit that much, though, did they? Or, yeah, they came through, uh, Bruce. They came through the old WWA over at the Olympia Stadium back in the uh, early 70s for a cup of coffee. They didn't stay in town very long. Was that, uh, when, was that during the uh, the so-called wrestling wars in Montreal yeah, that at that was, time uh, with the, yeah, the Rougeaus yeah, that was, and uh, that Yeah, bunch, that was uh, the uh, wrestling war. They brought them in. I think I, re- I recall seeing them uh, over at the Olympia myself. I saw the... Uh, the Shans in uh, 1971. I saw both Mad Dog and Butcher. Then I saw Butcher wrestle separately. Uh, he had R- Ricky Cortez as a tag team partner. Oh, yeah. Then I remember uh, seeing the guys up there in Toronto on a couple of occasions in 73 and 74. And other Canadians, French Canadians, that were pretty big here, I recall, at the Cobo Arena, the Rougeau family. Their dad, Johnny Rougeau, Jacques Rougeau, headlined many abouts with the Sheik at Cobo. Were and Paul and we, uh, Maurice, uh, were they working with or against the Rougeaus back then? I know they were involved with Grand Prix. I yeah. discerned with Gino and uh, Dino Bravo and Carpanche and uh, possibly Joe Poisson and uh, Le Duc. So I didn't know those guys all made their way to Detroit or... Uh, I yeah. know Killer Kowalski was yeah. part of that well, uh, so-called Grand Prix uh, thing that yeah, was... Mad, uh, mainly, Bruce, they worked over at the Olympia Stadium, opposition to the Sheik. Is that where that the old the uh, Bad uh, the Dog Red Wings Butcher. used to play there back in those days? Oh, yeah, the Big Red Barn, they called that, the old Olympia home of the Red Wings. The uh, gl- uh, glory days of Sid Abel and Ted Lindsay oh, and Gordy Howell, Gordy Howell and, uh, and uh, Terry Sawchuck and... and yeah, that's quite a place. That was quite a quite a arena for many of uh, many events of all types. Yeah, was the Sheik uh, was he running uh, was he running Cobo or uh, Olympia back in those days? He ran the Cobo Arena, Bruce, from 1965 and until 1980. And, I assume uh, that uh, neither the Olympia or the Cobo were. There anymore? They're both been. Uh, Olympia's of been tore ball. down. The wrecking ball hit the Olympia Stadium back in 1979. Uh, Cobo Arena is still standing, but it's been remodeled. Oh, it is. Does it still host anything notable, or? No, ma- mainly Bruce. They remodeled it to uh, hold conventions and the auto show, things like that. No more wrestling. The arena, as we know it, has been long gone. How many seats did that initially, uh, when the Sheik was in his heyday, how, how big was that cowboy? I often wondered, you know, is it, yeah. it's probably a bit smaller than the Olympia, I assume. Yeah. The uh, Cobo Arena, Bruce, could hold around 12,000 fans, and the Olympia Stadium, you're talking fifteen to 16,000. Was there any smaller buildings out there, Mark, that they used to wrestle in, yeah, they, in uh, that the area? Big, the big-time wrestling promotion headed by the Sheik, and yeah, they would wrestle all around Michigan, different venues, uh, nothing as big as the uh, large arenas in Detroit, but they would make the tour and uh, put on spot shows, and uh, they would go to Ohio quite frequently and Virginia, and, uh, you know, they they uh, they were they, they uh, did a great job 
a great job as, as for promoting, you know, the promotion. Was there any other uh, notable promotions? I remember hearing of some of the so-called oppositions uh, promotions that were coming in there with uh, maybe Sam Meneker and Barnett and Doyle and some of those guys. I don't know they were friends or foes or predecessors or yeah. whatever with Eddie Farhead or I remember just hearing some of the uh, scuttlebutt, even the uh, Burt Ruby. Uh, I guess he uh, did. He sell the territory to the Sheik, or did, was he the yeah the, uh, the way that predecessor? Worked, was, yeah, nineteen sixty-five. The Sheik and his father-in-law Francis Fleischer, which was the Sheik's uh, yeah, wife, and they father, always had him as construed as the, the front promoter. Man. Yeah, he was the front man. They went in and and they bought the promotion from Jim Barnett and Johnny Doyle, uh, 1965, and uh, they paid fifty thousand dollars for the promotion. And the Sheik gave them. I found this out through Jim Barnett a few years before he died. Fifty thousand dollars was the price. Uh, Ten thousand dollars down and forty monthly payments of one thousand dollars. Got them big time wrestling. This included the lease at the Cobo Arena, which had three years left on it, Then it could be renewed after the three years, the TV deal, and membership in the NWA. I've got our guests coming on now. I've got Eve LaRue. Eve, welcome to Heartbeat Radio. Are you on the air? Yes, I am. Thank you very much for having me. Hi, Eve. Eve, uh, Bruce Hart, uh, uh, Mark got... Bouchan. Also yeah, on hi, there. Mark. Hi, Eves. How you doing? Nice to talk to you. Welcome uh, to Paul Vichon. Great to have you on our show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Uh, amazing. Some of the guys you worked with, the Peter Maivias and the uh, George Gorienkos and the Billy Robinsons. And, um... <laughs> These were all guys that, uh, when I was in England with uh, Peter Maivia, I took him also to wrestle in in Paris at the Palais des Sports, and I said, uh, "When you, when you're ready to leave here, I said you got to come to America for God's sake, because he, he was a, already an international star. You know, he was <laughs> actually from from uh, Samoa by way of New Zealand, and I had met him there in England, and uh, he was a real surprise to me because I didn't know." Wrestlers like that came from Samoa, so I, I also wrestled them in the States, and I wrestled them all over. Peter was a friend of mine. He, uh, I, I've been f- friends with his family ever since. And, yeah, a lot uh, of the I, uh, listeners out there, if they don't know Peter Maivia, he's the grandfather of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And, uh, yes, absolutely. The father-in-law <laughs> of uh, Rocky Johnson, who was another... Uh, African American guy from Nova Scotia. Did, did you know uh, Rocky that well, uh, Paul? Or? Yeah, actually, I, I I I tell everybody that will listen to me that uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, has the most unique heritage and parentage of anybody else in the world. His his father was a product of the Underground Railroad slaves that got smuggled out of the United States and in the Civil into Canada War, yeah. and formed a colony in Nova Scotia and that's where Rocky Johnson came from and his mother is a princess from the Samoan Isles so there's nobody else in the world that has that unique heritage I mean that's pretty unique indeed I have a picture of uh, Dwayne uh, Dwayne Johnson, when he was five years old, sitting on my knee. <laughs> yeah, he was. Uh, I know Rocky. Rocky yeah. Johnson kind of started right. out in Calgary in about '66. Yeah. Old so Whipper Watson sent him up here. He'd uh, kind of trained him a bit, or spent some time with him, and he came up and um, he got over pretty well up here. And then he later on went to. Uh, I think San Francisco and kind of got his so-called break in there and became a pretty, uh, pretty also, big star. I think that's where he met Peter Maivia's daughter down maybe in San Fran. And, uh, yeah, and, I, uh, uh, 
I, uh, Rocky Johnson also wrestled for us in, in Grand Prix wrestling. When I was oh yeah, he old, was uh, he was a pretty major star by uh, by that time. He was one of the top black guys in the uh, in the business, business kind of. Uh, Absolutely. And I think he worked for Vince Senior a bit. And, um, yes, he did. And he, he told me about that time when I saw him again. He says, uh, my son is going to be a prince when he's born. I guess his wife was pregnant. I says, how do you know? He says, oh, I'm sure he is. And he, <laughs> and that's what <laughs> Rocky Johnson is. He, I mean, uh, uh, Ro- I mean... <laughs> And Wayne Johnson is. He's a prince. He's a Samoan prince, believe it or not. He yeah. turned out pretty good in the world of wrestling. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, his mother, I, I, I've, often, uh, I've often said his mother, Ata, which I've known since she was like 16 years old. We used to yes, he was a nice nice kid. I knew them in Hawaii when they were, uh, Peter and his wife, Leah, were... Uh, Promoting back there in the early '80s, there and I used to see yeah. Rocky Dwayne, as they yeah. called him back then. He was yeah. he was just kind of a little uh, kid back then. And uh, Peter Maivia's daughter Ata, she belongs in the Wrestling Hall of Fame, believe it or not, for just the the parents that she had. For one thing, her father was a wrestler, her mother was a wrestling promoter in, in Hawaii. Her husband, Rocky Johnson, was a wrestler, and her son was a wrestler. I see her at the Cauliflower Alley every year, and she's the one that gave me that picture when the kid was sitting on my knee years ago. And uh, <laughs> if there's ever a, a, a someone that really does belong in the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame because of her of her family connections at a Riata. Oh yeah, I think a lot of fans don't realize the uh the heritage that uh, Dwayne the Rock has with uh you know uh Canada and uh yeah. New Zealand and um uh, Samoa Everywhere, right? and all of that, you know, that was a pretty uh colorful history and all those people were legends, Peter Maipi and Rocky Johnson and all that. They're all pretty yeah. uh respected guys in the industry. I was checking on some of your uh, this amazing number of guys you worked with, Paul, as a lot of those old shooters I noticed were on your resume with people like Luther Lindsay and Billy Robinson and uh, your brother Maurice, of course, and some of those old shooters from England, Gordienko and Billy Joyce and... Uh, Gordon Nelson, some of those guys uh, within the in- industry. So those are some of the most feared shooters of oh, their absolutely. era. You know, absolutely, uh, some pretty tough guys. Yeah, and uh, actually, the, the 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 tougher they were, the more respect they had for someone that had done the same kind of wrestling. Of course, do you understand that, right? At uh, at 17, I had been a silver medalist in the Canadian Championship in Regina when I was 17 and a half years old. And on the way back on to Montreal on the bus, I called my brother when we went through Chicago because the Trans Canada had not been built in those days. And I used I went back on the on the bus and we went through Chicago. I called my brother in Texas. And I said, hey, Mad Dog, I won a silver medal in the Canadian Championship. He said, that's enough amateur wrestling. You'll never make money at that. He says, this summer you're going to turn pro. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I, the first match I had was against uh, Dory Funk Sr. Whoa. in Calgary along with Mad Dog. And, uh, and uh, I was afraid to get into the ring. Finally, Mad Dog says, listen. You better get in that damn ring, because if you don't, you're going back to the farm, milking cows and shoveling manure. So, so <laughs> I, I, I still got in the ring, and and uh, um, Dory Funk Sr.'s partner was some old guy named Tony Morelli. And, oh, yeah, I remember old Tony Morelli. Uh, yeah, he was a real shooter, too. And uh, he, 
he, he saw that I, I was scared, but he also knew how. He also knew that I was just out of the amateurs, and I knew, I knew how to leg dive. And he told me, he said, "Look, quit fooling around." He says, "You know, in the amateurs, when you leg dive, and he's saying this under his breath, always circling around, I'm still trembling." And I leg dived him, and I've never been stage fright ever since then. <laughs> that's been a long time ago, <laughs> and that's one that's in the books, actually. I've got to ask you, Paul. This is Eve, by the way. I've got to ask you. Um, in a couple of texts here and there that we find online, um, one of the ring names you had, or basically the only major nickname you had, was Nikita Zolotov. But yes. when you type that in, you can barely find anything. How long did that last, and where did that happen? After I had that one match in, in North Bay, uh, Jack Britton from Montreal sent me. Uh, Jack Britton was an agent for all the midget wrestlers all over, and he was a famous right. wrestler before. And uh, he sent me to wrestle in Detroit, in which... He was a partner in the territory, and after they used me for a couple of weeks, Bert Ruby, the promoter, he said, look, he says, you're a very good wrestler. He says, an amateur wrestler, but you have a baby face. He says, you look too young, and the people here, they don't believe in someone like that, and I almost cried, man. I mean, I so wanted to be a professional wrestler. It's not even funny. I, I, I didn't know what to say. And he said, "You better go home." After two weeks, he told me. He said, "So I, I'm fighting the tears back. Believe it or not, the butcher at that at that young age could still cry and uh, fight the tears back." I said, "How about if I grow a beard?" He says, "You do that." And shave your head, he says, we'll use you as a Russian. It was at the time of the Sputnik that just started, that little satellite that the Russians had sent up. And then the Cold War was on. And uh, he, he said, if, if you grow a beard and shave your head, he says, we'll, we'll call you Nikita Zolotov, except that it wound up to be Nikolai Zolotov. I don't know how that happened. But I went home for a couple of months. My beard grew real fast. I came I came back there and shaved my head, and for a couple of years, he sent me all over as a Russian. I, I wrestled with the Kalmykov brothers against Vern Gagne, Bronco Nagurski, and Elio De Paolo in Minneapolis, for God's sakes. <laughs> Carl and Ivan Kalmykov were my partners. And then from there, Bert sent me everywhere for a couple of years. I sent me to Texas, and and uh, that's how long it lasted. And I wound up in St. Louis, and some young guy booked me in Atlanta. And But he says they don't need no Russian there. So I went back to being... Paul Vashon, and that's where I got the name Butcher Vashon. Oh, my, listen, first of all, I got to tell you, when I came back, Mad Dog says, listen, he says, we got to find you some kind of animal name, he says. Ever since the, the wrestling promoter in Portland gave me the name of Mad Dog, he says, I've been making nothing but money. I says, well, all right, well, what should I call myself? I figured, well, he was going to say, well, Paul the Fox or, or Paul the Bull. So he came up with this. He says, I know what it is. We're going to call you Paul the Pig. I said, the hell with you. I'm not going under the name Paul the Pig. And then he started laughing, and I started laughing. So, so, so um, we decided on the butcher. So, so it wasn't an animal name, but it was just as diabolical, I guess, as Mad Dog. <laughs> but anyway, I've, I've had that name ever since then. There's quite a few stories about being uh, the Russian heel back in, in, in those days. 
Uh, I know that uh, another guest that was supposed to be on today that can't, that couldn't uh, be on, uh, Mike Dubois, Michel Justice Dubois, known here in Montreal, uh, but also basically had a second career, and it all started in uh, San Francisco. And uh, he told me the story that uh, the only reason he became a Russian was because his English was so bad. And he had too much of a French accent, and uh, so he was told, shave your head, grow the beard, and start rolling your R's and uh, become a Russian. And he made a lot of money with that. That, that. that was the thing to do in those days, if you if you either had the language or the, or the look. Oh, absolutely. I don't think any of those Russians were Russians, were they? Like, uh, Ivan Koloff was from Quebec or something, wasn't he, or... Oh, I think he was Northern Ontario. Northern yeah. Ontario, and uh, he's, he's I know the Kalmakovs, they were not Russians, uh, Carol Krauser, and uh, I, I know we had, we my dad started that big, uh, his name was Joe, Joe Perusevich, who became Nikolai Volkov in WWE years later, but I don't recall any of those Russians uh <laughs> being Russian as I recall. I think most of them were French Canadian or uh <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> you know, when you think about it. Uh, but, uh, they tell me that French Canadian makes make the best Russians they used to the freezing winters and everything, of course. <laughs> I think if you had been a real Russian in those days you probably would have been arrested or you know, uh, <laughs> McCarthy or thrown in jail for being a a terrorist or a traitor or something like that. <laughs> well, come to think of it, I don't think, I don't remember uh, any wrestlers actually being from Russia or born in Russia and having a, a major career here in North America. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, and I remember it was the same with the Germans. I know my dad broke in uh, Fritz von Erich and he had Waldo von Erich back in the day in uh, some old Kurt von Hess. Hans yeah, Herman, Hans Bill, Bill Terry, uh, Kurt von Hess, and uh, another guy named Carl Schatz or John Anson. But I, might, right. I remember all these when I was a little kid. My dad had all these supposed Russians and Germans up here, and almost all of them were, had French Canadian accents. <laughs> they were nice guys. I remember uh, I was kind of confused at the time. You know, I, and my dad was, you know, he, he always kayfabing his kids uh, we thought these guys actually were Russians and Nazis and stuff like that and all these I actually, Japanese. When, I, when I was traveling around the world I, I, I really traveled uh, extensively you know I wrestled in 33 countries and that's because I wanted to do that I wanted to, and the wrestling business afforded me to do that Except that I had to go to countries where they had professional wrestlings, wrestling, and that's why I never did get to Russia. I really wanted to go to Russia or China, but they were, there was actually no professionals there, so there was no way for me to go there. And now that I'm oh yeah, I remember. And decrepit, I don't know that I want. I was to pretty take... people. They forget how. How kind of uh, pronounced all the politics were back then? I know I wrestled in Germany in the seventies and uh, yeah. I, with Dynamite Kid, and we were over in Berlin, and they had the Berlin Wall up at that time, and uh, sure. it was uh, you know they gave you all these warnings, you know, don't uh, try to get into East Germany and all that stuff, you know, you'll be shot on sight and all that stuff. But, yeah, it was a different world back then, you know, and, and none of the Russians, uh, even like the hockey players, none of them were allowed to try to defect or any of that stuff, you know. You, you almost forget about it now. It's kind of common with all the yeah. Russian hockey players in the NHL, but back then it was... Uh, it well, was, the Cold uh, War is supposedly over, anyway. Yeah, a different, <laughs> different world back then, but... Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a different Cold War nowadays compared to back then, but at least we have uh, they have a lot more freedom and 
Uh, we get the benefit from uh, better athletes. Not so much in wrestling still. And, and like you said, Bruce, before, it's because there was never pro wrestling back in, in Russia, you know, before the wall came down. Same thing with China. So even if there is, I don't know if there is today, but if there is, it's at the infant stage. You know, yeah, not well yeah, developed. You know, if there was pro wrestling in those countries, us that are still around in the business, we would know about it. We would have, you know, we would have heard stories about it. I don't think there is, actually. There's probably no market for it. And, of course, there could be, you know, if somebody started it. <laughs> but that's, that's a good idea for it to start a new territory. Let's do that's for I've often wondered, Russia Paul, China, you know, with, there's like a billion people in China. I'm surprised that uh, yeah. they haven't uh, oh, brought be some Americans in there and cast them as villains and had a bunch of these little Bruce Lee types uh, beating up the big, ugly Americans and uh, whatever, yeah. you know. I, Absolutely. And, of course, the, the big, ugly Americans would still be French-Canadians with... Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah well. I noticed you were in Japan a bit in the '60s, Paul. What was it like back in those days? The it must have been the uh, the Baba. Uh, I don't even know their Anoki was working by that time. Or yeah, well, um, uh, what was that like back in the day? I'm, I know my dad used to send a few of his old guys, like my Ursus and some of them over there back then, but. Uh, who were some of the was, guys you worked with back in those days in uh, in Japan? Actually, I, when I first went, I went in '67, and I, yeah, I was that through uh, Mike Mike LaBelle's office with Joel Strongbow yes, and that bunch. Yes, yes um, the, the Japanese guy, I forget who. He was the was agent. That, was that, that Baba or? Uh, no, the, the, I mean the guy from. From uh, Charlie Moto, Francisco from Los Angeles. He was Is that Charlie he, Moto. He, yeah, that's it, Mr. Moto. Yeah, he's the he's the one that sent me. There was seven of us, and and uh, we stayed there for seven weeks. And some of the guys went nuts. I mean, uh, <laughs> Angelo Poffo. I, I oh, once yeah. went to Japan with him. He, he was. We only went there for two weeks, and on uh, the minute he got there, he clammed up. He wouldn't eat or anything like that. And he, o- he only opened up he, uh, when we got back on the plane, flying back to the states. And I asked him. I said, "What the hell happened to you?" He says, "You know, I was petrified to die there, and I didn't want to eat. He didn't sleep. He didn't talk to nobody." Because he was petrified that it was something in his mind that said if he ate any of the food that he would die there and <laughs> nobody back home would know about it. It, it. it was anyway. That's psychological on his behalf. But he was a big star, Angelo Poffo. You know. Well, and Dick Byers was he on? Did, what's he, that? He kind of got a his. Break over in Japan, I gather, in the '60s, there and became yeah. one of the first Americans to really get over over there. Who's that? The Mask destroyer or whatever. Oh yeah. Well, of course he speaks Japanese. He he learned it over there. I was there with him, in 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 '67, uh, I think, and, and that was the first time we were there six weeks. And uh, he took me around, and and uh, after a while, he made a, you know, a big part of his career was over there, and he belonged. Oh yeah, that was his uh, his bread and butter, that uh, the, the Japanese tours, you know. And yeah. And, they used to and, make pretty good money over there, as I recall. I know uh, later on, sure my dad said he was seen on TV and everything, and he he spoke Japanese. His wife. She she was over there working too after a while and and she could speak Japanese and his son Kurt oh he yeah was a big boy himself he speaks Japanese the whole family does and he was a bigger star there than he ever was over here 
I, I remember it was tough to get in there back in those days. You know, you had to uh, yeah. you had to go through the L.A. office, I guess. I remember my dad yeah. set Abby up with uh, those guys down. It must have been the early 70s, and he became kind of a a big Actually, ticket over there, Abdullah. You I, know, I, and I, I went... I went for two, three different outfits. I, I must have gone half a dozen times. The last time I had stopped wrestling, and I took Luna and her partner over there. And uh, I, I was their manager for a, a girl's outfit in Japan. They stayed Oh, yeah. And uh, I guess us and the Vashan family, we had big experiences in Japan. I enjoyed the country. I mean, uh, the country, when I first went there, the people were not as spoiled uh, really as as they they got to be later on but i mean the japanese people are the greatest people in the world it's, they it's are, funny really. you... i mean we were taught to believe you know <clears> after <throat> the second world war when they attacked hawaii that they, they were they were no good and and <laughs> blah 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 and all that and we found the opposite i mean uh, Actually, oh yeah, I found they were always very uh, respectful and well, I treated you very know. well over there. You almost, almost too well. <laughs> it's it's funny that you uh, you mentioned the destroyer, uh, who by the way happens to be here in Montreal at a collector's fair. Uh, he's uh, here in Montreal this weekend, but well, I had a conversation uh, with the destroyer concerning his his time in Japan, and God knows he spent a lot of time in Japan, and he was telling me uh, exactly that. The thing that uh, stuck to his mind the most was the respect uh, the fans had for the business. And it didn't matter if it was a heel or a face. If they were uh, uh, astounded by a good move, and even if it came from the heel, they all applauded out of respect for the athlete. And he said, nowhere else in the world do you see that. Did you uh, you live the same thing, Paul, I guess, when you were there, too? Oh, I, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I said, oh, darn. I, when I first went there and, and looked at the wrestling matches, they, 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 they're all on wooden benches, but they bring cushions, and they put them down there. And, and they don't move. They don't say anything. I said, oh, darn, this is going to be hard. You know, get heat with these people. <laughs> but but uh, they when they don't like you, they let you know. You know, and they don't clap. <laughs> That's what it is. And they they clap for the for the for the faces and uh, and their own Japanese people, I guess. But uh, I enjoyed every every trip I ever had in Japan. I enjoyed every trip. We traveled extensively by train. They, by the way, uh, I, my wife and I and uh, uh, Roy and Lisa, who uh, Lisa was an uh, ex-professional lady wrestler, her husband's the cheapest man in the world. He's got a gimmick, too. And uh, we're uh, going to Western Even, even cheaper than uh, Angelo <laughs> Poffo. We, we, uh, we're taking a train ride on the Canadian. Believe it or not, from Montreal to Edmonton, I'm going to get off at Edmonton and go visit three of my boys that work on pipelines in Alberta. And then we're coming back on the train. And they, uh, the Mad Dog and I went to work for Stu in 1959, and that's how we got out there. It was on the train on the Canadian. It had been built in 1951. And in 59, it was like brand new. It had scenic domes all over and everything. And Mad Dog and I rode that. And I'm, and uh, since then, they were going to retire it, but they rebuilt it. And they put it back on schedule between uh, uh, Montreal and, and Vancouver. And, but it does go through uh, Edmonton now. So I'm going to get off in Edmonton. I'm going to rent a car. All four of us, and we're going to visit Banff and and uh, Alberta. Probably going to go through Calgary because my sons all live in Red Deer now, and they work on pipelines out there. So 
How did, how did they all come to live out here, Paul? I, I've actually run into you, a few of your kids the odd time out here, and then I got to know Luna. She was always a nice, and uh, Dave, Dave Heath. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. How, how did they uh, they come out to work on the pipelines, or how did that happen? Uh, the, the only member of my family, I mean, uh, my children was Luna that became a wrestler, you know. I had three boys. They did some amateur wrestling. And then uh, I, in the early 80s, when I, I, I thought I was taking an a, a early retirement, I went to work on the pipeline, and I introduced my boys to the guys that ran the, the union in Red Deer. And they all joined the union, and he got them all jobs, and now they make more money than I ever did. Just they work six oh, yeah, months out of the year. It was kind of booming in those days, too, in the 80s. $50,000 in that six months, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so when I need money, I call them up and borrow some from them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that has nothing to do with wrestling, but nevertheless, the, the background was... and. Of course, now they say they they meet all kinds of guys that that have seen their father and their uncle and and uh, and my daughter wrestle on TV. Of course, I see that everywhere now. Can't go nowhere. People say, "Well, we remember you." You know, I do fairs and festivals in 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 the Northeast United States, and I do uh, ten. I used to do fifteen fairs a summer, but now they're Gas yes, cost too much. I, I used to do some in Maine, and I used to do some in, in uh, Western Pennsylvania. I don't do those anymore. They're too far. I, I need anyway. That's another story. It has nothing to do with wrestling. But at this point in my life, everything I do has to do with wrestling because people remind me. I sit Did there. They? I sit there selling my stuff, and I've got some old timer. I uh, always come up to me and he said, boy, do we remember you and your brother wrestling on TV. And you know, if truth be known, I wrestled for 30 years. And out of the 30 years, I only wrestled partners with my brother maybe seven or eight years. When we first got started, he, he went his way, I went my way, and then we got together again for a little bit in Minneapolis. And wherever we went, by ourselves or together, we were, thank God, we were always successful. And that's really because my brother was a workaholic. And I mean, he was the smallest of my brothers. I got seven brothers, but he was the, he was three times tougher than I was, believe me. <laughs> how, how was your run in uh, Minneapolis? That was probably one of your best runs with Mad Dog and... Yeah, absolutely. Hey, yeah, I mean, who are some and, of the guys you worked with in, really have to, in that <clears> stretch, <throat> Paul? We, uh, we uh, after two and a half, three years there in Minneapolis. What uh, years Curtis were those Burnett in the early seventies, late sixties? And, and uh, uh, Yvonne Robert, an old time wrestler from Montreal, came down to talk to Mad Dog, and he says, "We want to start a new company in Montreal." Blah blah blah. And uh, Mad Dog said, okay. And then I said to him, I said, what the hell are you going to do with me now? You know, he says, what's the matter? He says, you're afraid I'm going to leave you out. He says, I'll give you half my share. So he gave me half his share. (laughs) (laughs) What what year was that, Paul? Uh, About early 70s, somewhere in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, It was like... Between seventy and seventy one, I think, and it didn't. It was very, very successful, but it didn't didn't last very long because we had too many partners, and uh, I got fed up. And I told Matt Dog, I said, "I'm selling out." He said, "Me too." So we sold out, and I who, made a prediction. Some of the main guys? I said, "Within a year, these guys will be out of business." Who yeah, was some of the main guys in David. Montreal at that time? Paul was were, like Kowalski. He was around there then, and yes, he was in the hell. Mad um, Dog and him drew the biggest house ever, and and they were both close to their fifties for gosh sakes. 
at, at the ballpark at Jerry Park in Montreal. Twenty nine thousand one hundred and seven people. Now drew what, baseball. Which what is year still was a record that? in uh, Canada for wrestling, except for the WrestleMania in Toronto. But it's still a record. Uh, it was just over twenty seven thousand for uh, wrestling. When yeah. was that? Like seventy two, seventy three, somewhere in there. Yeah, right around there. I mean, it had to be in the middle of of the of the Grand Prix wrestling days, and that lasted like from seventy one to seventy six, I believe. So old Carponche, he was around in those days too, wasn't he, Edward? Or? Sure, he was one of the partners, and he was the son of a gun that created all the mess in 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 the board meetings. We used to have board meetings, and I'd leave there mad every every damn time. I said. I said I couldn't take it anymore, so that's why. But, you know, I I always did what I wanted in life to, so that I would enjoy myself, and that, that's why I wrestled all, all, all over the world, so that I could meet different kind of wrestlers, different kind of people, and that's what I did. And And I don't regret getting out of it at all, except that it created quite a, a history, and to prove it, I've written four books about it. It's not only about <laughs> Grand Prix wrestling, but it's about wrestling and interesting people I met all over the world. If you find something you love to do in life, you'll never have to work another day in your life. And that was me in the professional wrestling. It wasn't a job. I mean, it was actually my way of living, but it was fun. I enjoyed every damn minute of it, even the crowbars that I wrestled with that potatoed me and everything. Some that did it on purpose, but I tell you what, <laughs> having wrestled in the early days in the Stu Hart territory, everybody was scared of us, Mad Dog and I. So, <laughs> so, so we we never did have really shooting matches in, in the wrestling ring. In, in the pro wrestling ring, that's no... That's no place for a shooting match. Hey, hey no, Paul, this is, uh, if I could, this is Mark from Michigan. Yes. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you some questions, if I can, Paul, about your AWA days back in the late 60s, uh, 69. You yes. were teaming with your brother, Mad Dog, and I was going to ask you, who were some of your opponents you like to work with? I know you took on Bruiser and Crusher and the uh, uh, Billy the Red Lion. in the world to work for. I mean, and that work for, work with, I mean, those guys were, uh, between the two of them, they had four left feet. But uh, I am thinking that the most, and you say enjoyable, had to be Red Bastien and Red Lions. Yeah. You had some tremendous matches with them in the uh, main events there. And uh, yeah. I was well, going to ask you also, Paul, about Detroit. And yes. uh, I remember seeing you in the Olympia Stadium. I was talking to Bruce about this earlier. I saw you in uh, Mad Dog once at the Olympia. I yes. saw you as a singles wrestler in Toronto. And yes. I saw you team in Detroit with Ricky Cortez. But have you ever been approached back in the day uh, with Ed Farhat, the Sheik, about coming to the Kobo Arena for working a good series with the Sheik? No. No, okay. I... I, I, I... When, when he was there, Farhat, I was still working for Bert Ruby, and and uh, that's where uh, Eddie Farhat was from. But I was really, I was really too young. I, I he was already a big star when I was just starting off at Nikolai Zolotov around around Detroit, okay. and I went back there after a while and, and wrestled as the with Jim Bernard, I was the brute, I think. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that didn't last very long either. But uh, anyway, I had the the, the occasion and the, of of meeting him, and I met him quite a few times after that. But I never did work with the, with uh, Farhat the Sheik. I worked with all kinds of other Sheiks. I mean, some were real Sheiks. <laughs> <laughs> That I worked at in India. All India right. was 
was one of the poorest countries I wrestled in. I enjoyed the most, though. And one of my sons was born there. He's, he's now living in Alberta. His name is Andre. And on his birth certificate, they have uh, they have a space for what caste he belongs to. So what would you think they would write on on his birth certificate since his mother and I were Canadians? So they wrote Canadian <laughs> instead of a caste. His, his caste is Canadian. Is what it is. <laughs> okay. And now, now he. he he chauffeurs a, a, a bulldozer on the pipeline, making Very more good. money than I ever did. Did you guys ever work for Vince Senior and uh, the old WWWF, or have any uh, involvement in that territory back in the pre WWF right. days? Let, let me tell you the story, okay? We uh, when we got successful in Grand Prix wrestling, we had. The Boston promoter called us up. He says, I want to come and talk to you guys. His name was Abe Ford. And oh, yeah, I remember his lawyer. Yeah. And he says, I'm promoter in Boston and in the New England area. And he says, I'm willing to sell you my territory. So he was asking a quarter of a million dollars for his territory. And I I, I we this was at a board meeting with all the partners and they said well that's you know we talked it over i said that's too much we we considered buying it did he have anything other than boston like the old state of Mass- massachusetts or well yeah new hampshire he, he talked about massachusetts and and new, new hampshire, hampshire maybe, and, yeah. and maine and everything and we we decided that we'd give him a hundred thousand dollars and uh, they went back to Boston. They were going to draw up the, the papers and everything, and I got a call. I got a call from uh, Vince McMahon Sr., and he said, Paul, he says, uh, I've never met you, but he says, I heard good things about you promoting Montreal, and he says, uh, let me put you the heads up on it. And he says, the guy that's trying to sell you Boston and the Northeast Territory, he says, a Ford, he says, he works for us. He's not, he, he, he's just a caretaker for us. He's a front man, and he does stupid things. Like he goes out and sells programs to to the fans and everything, and he says, listen, I want us to talk this over. He says, in in uh, in three weeks, we have a, 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 another show at the Madison Square Garden, and he says, we want to, why don't we book your brother and you? And he says, we'll make it a triple main event, and you guys will wrestle in the main event, and and we can sit down and, and talk about this. I said, yes, sir, Mr. McMahon, and we were there, and uh, he he had us come in a couple of days ahead of time. I, I think he, he guaranteed us $5,000 apiece, which was unheard of in those days. No, that's and, a pretty uh, good guarantee for the 70s. Yeah, and and uh, and uh, he says you come a couple of days early. We'll meet at the Pickwick. And we'll talk it over, and blah blah blah. And he, he 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 explained to us that the guy didn't have it for sale. And I said, well, I'm glad you called us in time before we did something foolish like that because they had the lawyer there and everything, you know. <laughs> so uh, and. And uh, that's when I made the contact with Vince, and we became pretty good friends. After those meetings, we went out drinking together, Mad Dog, me, and Vince Sr. And was Junior that, around in those days, Paul? What's that? Vince Jr., was he around back then? Yeah, but he was just the, An announcer. the commentator, yeah, uh, interviewer. And, and I'm not sure if he did the commentating. He... he he might have it at ringside in the in the gardens. They have a commentator, but that's anyway. That's beside the point. But that that's when I first met Vince McMahon, Senior, and then that's of course that's where I met a Junior, and then I worked for Junior. Actually, I worked quite a bit after I, we left Montreal. I called 
uh, Vince up. He says, Paul, he says, if you, if you and Mad Dog are quitting, he says, come on over. I said, Mad Dog's going to go back to Minneapolis. I said, I'm wanting to go someplace. He says, come on in. And I I worked for him for seven or eight years. Worked yeah, I know my brother Brett told me he worked with you uh, the odd time back in the early days, and I think yeah. the Bulldogs did too. I started my, uh, my fifth book, and it's about interesting people that I've met all over the world. And I, my tablet where I write, I'm I'm writing in the back the names of the people of, that I'm going to write about because they were so interesting and extraordinary people, like Stu and your mom and everything. And, uh, and they're, they have a chapter. You, your family has a chapter in my book. <laughs> anyway, I ran out of space on the back cover to write all the names, you know, like like The Rock, or the Chief Justice of the United States of America, Rehnquist, I met him personally, all kinds of people, Duke Ellington, I met him, and uh, and that's, it takes me far away from wrestling, but at least half of the people that I find extraordinary uh, people were in the wrestling business, believe it or not. Oh yeah, you're so you would be one of the more fascinating guys to talk to, Paul. Just having well, uh, I, I, not too many guys have been to all the places that you got to. You know, like most of the American wrestlers, even though they became big names in the states, not that many of them went to places like New Zealand and Australia and England and the Far East and uh, Japan and those places. <clears throat> well, you were one of the guys who toured those places you know, in your prime and kind of, you know, uh, met met all the guys from all the uh, different places. Like, not that many guys uh, I can think of that have uh, had as long a career as you and have been to so many places, you know, and you can, you can kind of... Well, that, that, that's really what I set out to do. Maurice didn't travel as much as you, eh? Well, he... Maurice traveled quite a bit when you figure he won a gold medal in New Zealand, you know. And that he was in the, in the Olympics. Empire Games back in the day. And the Empire Games, yeah. 48 and, or... 1950. And he's been, he's been pretty well, but he never went there really to wrestle and see the country. You understand? It's like most of the wrestlers... They would go for a couple of weeks here and there and come back because the money, the big money. Oh, they get a big payoff and uh, jump on the plane and come back. You know, there are not too many uh, stuck around. Yeah. Yeah, Bruce, uh, Bruce, uh, Bob here, I got a caller calling in. I wanted to say a few words. I think he uh, knows uh, Paul and you guys. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio. Who are we talking to? Hey, this is Bob Brooks. Long time no see, I don't think. True or not? Did you when did you wrestle uh, under a mask in Japan as Okoyami? Okoyama? No, I, I I never wrestled under a mask in Japan. But okay. I, I, hang yeah, on, I was on a wrestling site. That's why I asked, huh? I I I wrestled under Okoyama. Believe it or not, now Leo Garibaldi, who is a booker in Atlanta, Georgia, he says. We're going to have a loser leave town match. And Dandy Jack was my partner. And uh-huh. and uh, we had a loser leave town match, and I lost. So I had to leave town. But the next week, uh, Jack Crawford brought back an old Japanese wrestler with a mask and with uh, knee patches on his Long John's with a big belly hanging out, and and, and that was Okiyama, the masked Japanese wrestler, and that was me. Oh, thank you. Clear that up. <laughs> I guess 50 years later we can talk about it. Nobody's going to assume here or anything like that. There you go. I was going to ask anyway, you, Paul, if you ever had a chance to work with old Luthez. I know he yes. was up here in the 80s. He spoke very well of uh, some of the French Canadians. And I was yes. wondering if you or Mad Dog had any history with Lou. Well, uh, the only history with Lou we have is from...
friendship. I mean, he he came to one of the early CAC meetings in 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 uh, in Massachusetts. It was way back, way back. I mean, it was like around the twentieth meeting. Now there's there's been fifty of them, but Lutez was there. But I also wrestled him in Atlanta, Georgia, as uh, Nikolai Zolotov. I wrestled with Lou in Toronto. And yeah, I heard I, uh, he, he mentioned he worked with you guys in but 73, respect. 74, somewhere in there. Yeah, it had to be. But in, in any case, I, we, we, uh, we were, Mad Dog, both Mad Dog and I, we were friends with, with Lou. And, and uh, I, believe it or not, Lou, at 21, was world champion. Uh, in 1937, that's the year I was born, for gosh sakes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, sir. And he was in his 50s when, when I wrestled him. And I tell you what, I never tried to get behind him or anything. <laughs> but, but I had very good matches, and uh, that's why he made such a great champion, because he, he could adapt to anybody he worked with. Did, did you ever work with Bruno, Paul? Yes. I, I, I worked uh, quite a few times with Bruno, and I knew I knew the secret of working with Bruno, and that was to make him look really good and don't make it last very long. So I never had any matches that that lasted more than 10 minutes with him. I wrestled in, in Long Island, New York. I wrestled in Philadelphia. I wrestled with Bruno quite a few places, actually. Did you ever work with Backlund, Paul, or was he after your... Uh... Oh, I, I worked with Backlund when he was champion. And, and uh, I, I thought that he was a very good wrestler, although, for my liking, being the champion, he lacked a little bit of color, I thought, you know. I mean, yeah, even I've the heard guys that, you that know, that was. Uh, even even Nick, Nick Hutton had a better personality than, than Backlund, you know. And that was the trouble. I mean, that's why they kept bringing back Taz, because, I mean, he was. He could handle and beat just about anybody. But uh, he also had a personality. He was a likable guy. And a lot of the NWA champions in those days, had, 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 you know, didn't have no no color in the ring. I mean, one one of the, well, I thought one of the good ones was uh, Fat O'Connor, although Fat O'Connor, you know, was not... All, I mean, I'm judging everybody here, and I guess I shouldn't do that. But yeah, my dad he, told me he was a hell of a worker, Pat O'Connor. Yeah, very, he was, uh, and he was a good guy, too. Yeah. The New what Zealand about, uh, if I may, what about Don Leo Jonathan, Paul? Don Leo? Yeah, Don Leo. Jesus, the match of the century. that We call it the match of the century. Where When we first got the giant from France. His, his name was Andre Rusimov. I said, shit, we can't use that name here in Montreal. It's not going to mean anything. So there used to be a a, a giant in, in French-Canadian lore. His name was Leo Ferry. He was a strong man and a giant, so we gave him the name of Jean Ferry. And we had the, the match of the century at, at the Forum between what year Don was Leo that Jonathan, when was that? Seventy three, seventy four, somewhere in there. Seventy three, I think. Uh, you know, that was at Jerry Park. No, that was at the Forum. That oh, the Montreal I call Forum. It match of the century. I, did, I could not wrestle in Jerry Park or in, in the Forum because it, it, I held the license for Montreal, and it was governed by the. Montreal Athletic Commission, and they wouldn't let the promoter wrestle. So anyway, the match of the century, uh, we uh, the biggest house they had ever had in, at the Forum before us was 
forty thousand dollars, but I'm not surprised they had a, a ticket up in the bleachers worth fifty cents for kids and shit like that. Pardon my expression. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we 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 hyped it up uh, for for about three months. All the interviews that we had on television. Uh, in Montreal, I told all the guys to talk about the big match of the century coming up between Andre the Giant and Don Leo Jonathan. Who's Jonathan the heel or the know. face? Who is the face or who is the heel? And... Uh, well, it doesn't, it, at that point, it didn't really matter. And, and uh, Jonathan would have been... Uh, would have been he, he was actually the, the villain. Uh, because the other guy was a Frenchman, of course. <laughs> anyway, uh, they, uh, at, at 7 o'clock in, in Montreal, the day of the show, it started raining, it started hailing rain and snow and hail together, and that actually killed our house. But we still had eighty-four thousand dollars, eighty-four thousand nine hundred and five dollars. I asked the guy that was selling tickets that night. I mean, in the box office, he says, "I says how much was the house?" He says, "He says give me five dollars, and the house will be eighty-five thousand dollars." It more than doubled, and the, the forum wasn't even half full. When I told the manager of the forum, I says, they, they, they used to sell ringside tickets $2. I says, are you nuts? I says, we're going to charge $10. He said, oh, no, you can't do that. People will stay away. I says, all right, how about $8? And that's four times bigger than the other. And still the house was only half full, and we drew $85,000. So, uh, you know, and we we did that all through the days of uh, Grand Prix wrestling, not only at the ballpark between uh, Kowalski and, and Mad Dog, too. Between them, they were 100 years old, for Christ's sake. <laughs> How long did that <laughs> but, last in there, Paul? Or what, what happened that, uh, when they had the uh, promotion? Promotion wars and or whatever. How what? How did that end end up there with uh, the two promotions? They both. Uh, well, did they make peace or did they both kill themselves or what happened? No, I actually, my, my brother and I got out of it before that the war was done. That was still. It was starting to uh, get too heavy then, or no. That, that, that's not it. We we pretty well had it won, actually. I mean, we did everything we wanted, but Montreal and that territory around there, the best, the best wrestling territory in the world. They used to have four or five wrestling matches every week right there in Montreal in different places, and all of them were packed and everything. But what happened? We told them if they kept on like this. We sold our interest, Mad Dog and I, for $25,000 a piece. And we told them, I told them, I said, if you guys carry on like this, I said, in a year you'll be out of business. And they were. Yeah, for and, everybody's um, benefit, the uh, <clears throat> what was referred as the master of the century, uh, the Montreal Forum actually happened on, I've got it right in front of me. On May 31st, 1972. There you go. Also look for the first time that Andre the Giant got body slammed. And you'll find out it was me. I, <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned that, Paul, because on a uh, Facebook group uh, just a couple of weeks ago, somebody was claiming that uh, Andre was first uh, dropped by uh, Hulk Hogan. And I went on to say, no, 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 no. He was slammed way before that. And I said, if I'm not mistaken, if my memory serves me right, it was Paul Vachon that did it 
uh, at least here the first time in North America. I don't know about Japan, but I know in North America it was you, Paul, that slammed him the very first time. The, the promoter was Dick the Bruiser in, in Chicago called me up, and he said that, he said, hey, Butcher, we want to use your giant. We hear you're doing great business. Well, I said, he's never been out of France <laughs> and never out of Canada. I said, I don't know if we send them to you, and I don't think we will. Uh, we'll have to send our own man to work for him, uh, with him and everything. And he said, uh, well, what's his name anyway? Dick the Bruiser said that. I said, well, his name is Jean Ferry. He said, what kind of name is that? He said, Jean Ferry. He says, how do the French people call him? Well, the French people call him Le Jean Ferry. He says, how the hell do you say that in English? I said, well, you say it. I'm trying to do the translation in English, but it's still in French. I said, they call him the giant fairy. He says, are you freaking nuts? He says, we can't call this seven foot six guy the giant fairy. He says, we'll get laughed out of the, of the promotion business. He says, what the hell is his real name? I said, his real name is Andre Rusimov. He says, well, we're going to call him Andre the Giant. And he said, how much do I have to pay for him? I said, well, it's going to cost you. And Hamden Hard, and I said, $10,000. I figured he'd say, you, you're nuts. Because in those days, that was unheard of, you know. And I said, 5000 for the guy that's going to wrestle him. And he hummed and hawed, and he stung up on me. Then he called back. He says, all right. Dick the Bruiser says, we'll pay 10000 for him, and... Who's going to wrestle him? I said, I am, you stupid idiot. I said, I'm the one that's going to get the money. I didn't <laughs> call him a stupid idiot. You didn't do that to Dick the Bruiser. But anyway, so we get into the ring, and it's a handicap match. And Larry Henning, who's my partner, has never seen him before. And we're both in the ring. And he said, and then he sees him come in, and he's laughing. The giant puts one big foot over the top rope, comes in, you know, six foot four, I mean seven foot four, weighed about 500 pounds at that time, and he's laughing, and he said, Jesus, what the hell are we going to do with him? So I tell him, I said, I bet you I can body slam him. And he says, yeah. <laughs> then he starts laughing. But before sitting... The stakes, we have to go to the middle of, of the ring, and the referee is checking Larry and me, and I'm talking to the giant in French. I said, I told I told my, my partner I could body slam you, and the giant says, okay, boss. He used to yep. call me boss, the son of a gun. And the first thing I did was body slam him, and I said, what? kind of foolish thing that I just do. So I just jumped up and I said to him, body slam me a couple of times. And bing, bang, bing, bang, just about killed me with the body slams and everything. And when Mad, when, when Mad Dog heard about it, he just about drummed me out of the family. He said, what the hell were you doing? Body slamming the giant. But that's the thing. That was how many years ago? And that's the thing people talk to me about. They said, we saw you on eBay when you body slammed the giant, blah, 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 and everything. So <laughs> it, it, it never stopped them from from being very popular and making movies and, and becoming very rich. So I guess it, it was all right. Now I can give me something to bullshit about. <laughs> It's a great Pretty story. Good story, right? That, that's the trouble when you get, when I get on a, on a radio program like this where people call in. I have too many stories to tell, and and uh, people don't have a chance to ask questions. I'm sorry about that, guys. Hey, Paul. This is Mark again from Michigan. I have another question for you. Yes. Uh, these are tremendous stories you have. They are, and the territories 
were tremendous. And I, my thoughts, I, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are of today's wrestling and what the future might hold for today's wrestling. Wrestling nowadays is a paradox. I mean, it's like, it's really like a machine to print money. They, uh, they instead of maybe 2,500 full-time professional wrestlers like we were, I mean, professionals, now they, they own, we used to have wrestling in all the towns big enough in the world, in, in the free world. You know, in Canada, the U.S., England, all, all over the place. But now they only have it in one place. And they show it to all the TV sets in the world simultaneously for anybody that has the 70 or $75 to pay per view. And that is like the machine to print money. The rest of the guys... They can only use maybe 50, and those, they change every four or five years. So if you're a new guy, I don't want to discourage anybody, but if you're a new guy starting in the wrestling business, hoping to be a professional wrestler, your chances are slim and none. So wrestling makes more money, but it's dead. It can still be done, but it has to be done differently. Oh, totally. They need to uh, go. I've said it many times that you need to go back and re sow the seeds at the grassroots, and you got to uh, spread the gospel. You know, right now they've got it all in one place, and uh, it's dying everywhere else. If, if, Ultimately, if I, they're going to collapse may, from you, within. Uh, if I may, you may uh, we may be starting to see a small change, and I think Paul is aware. Uh, we have an indie star for a long time here in Montreal that just is coming up in the WWE right now, uh, Kevin Owens. We know him as Kevin Steen. Yeah, and, they need more. Uh, they need a lot more guys like that. And that used to well, be like that it. all he's, the time. He's not your stereotypical wrestler. He doesn't have the body. He doesn't have the face. Which is uh, why, that's more one old. of the reasons why he's getting over because he's not like the uh, cookie cutter uh, yeah, muscle head uh, high spot artist. You know, he actually exactly. Old and, for, and from what I uh, from what I gather from uh, the information I can get is uh, you've got Triple H that does want to tend to try to go back a little bit with old school. Well, they need to they need to shit or get off the pot. They can't just talk about it. They actually got well, to exactly. But I think it, he's know, getting uh, bullshit, resistance you know. from uh, from Vinnie Mac, and that seems to be the problem. Uh, Paul, as usual, uh, it was great talking to you. Are we going to see you at the see at the Cauliflower Alley Club in uh, in April? I'm not sure. I, I I really am not sure. I'm I'm taking a a train ride as I told you. <laughs> back to Alberta and back to Montreal. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for coming on. Uh, you know, uh, enjoyed your stories, and uh, as I've told you before, I know my dad had tremendous respect for you and uh, Maurice. You know, you guys are two of yes, his favorite I, I, I guys. And, and, and uh, uh, you know... Uh, we likes to... We, we, we likes to, and, and your mother... And uh, the whole family, actually, I remember Stu washing you guys down in the bathtub with the garden hose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Including anyway. your hitman. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, th thank you very much for calling. And uh, let's do this again sometime. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks Bye -bye, very much, Paul. Paul. Uh, God bless, and uh, I'll look forward to the next time. Thank you. All right. Yeah, already has, sir. Thank you.